Good morning. It's good to see so many of you. Um, and singing those songs, my reaction was just, man, I love Jesus. Uh, he is so, so good. And man, I love this church. I love being your pastor. I love being a part of this community. It's such a huge gift. And so my name is Logan. I'm the lead pastor here uh, at Lower Manhattan Community Church. Uh, I want to begin just in prayer, expressing uh, in prayer what we just uh, sang together in song. So join me in prayer. Jesus, we do declare that we love you, that it's your kingdom that we really want more than anything in this world. That even though we have known darkness, we have known doubt, even though right now we feel like we only see in part and we really hope that there is so much more goodness to come, we trust you and we know that you are Lord and that you are doing a good work. And I pray today that we would find you to be more magnificent after we celebrate you than when we came in so that we would not lose sight that we are following you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, today is a very special Sunday here at LMCC. Uh, It is Mission Sunday, and after our service, we have a vision meeting. Uh, Mission Sunday is something we do every single year, and we do it to celebrate that we have a privilege to partner with over 20 organizations to take the message and the mercy of Jesus Christ into the streets of New York City and all over the world. And on our vision meeting, we're going to introduce to you new pastors, new staff, new vision and mission for what God has for us in the future and initiatives that we are being called to as a church. And as I was preparing for this day and reflecting on it, I was just incredibly humbled and in awe of God for two reasons. First, just to reflect on the fact that there is a movement of God happening right now in this place, in this city, all over the world. And while we've been somewhat distracted and had our attention on the pandemic and politics and all kinds of things, God's movement is continuing to advance in miraculous ways. There is this monumental work of God happening in lives all over the world And what's amazing is that God has said, I have trusted you to be a part of it. He has entrusted this church community with an assignment to participate in this move of God in this moment, that he has not overlooked us, but he has seen us as someone he can trust and invite into that. And that's incredible, that God has a mission for this world And he says, I want you to be a part of it, and I trust that you will. That's what he is saying to you and to me and to this church. And that idea that God is looking down on the earth and looking for people that he can trust with this mission has something that God's been just um, playing over and over in my head over this last month. That this God of the universe says, I look down at your brokenness. I look down on the hurting I look down on the division. I look down on the sickness that we're experiencing. And God says, I want to bring healing and human flourishing. I want to bring hope to those who are in despair. He has this vision for what he wants this city to look like. And it's so much better than what we're seeing. Because we're not a ghost town and we're not an anarchist district. But God wants so much more for this city than we were even experiencing beforehand. And he has this dream of what it could become. And there's this idea throughout the scriptures that God looks down from heaven and says, who wants to join me? And then he's looking for anybody whose heart will say yes. This idea about that came to me about a month ago. Um, About a month ago, you know, we... Uh, we took a trip up to Connecticut in the middle of the week, and you know, all of us are trying to figure out how in the world do we stay sane while we're working from home. Those of us with kids are trying to figure out how we keep our kids sane in their educational environments uh, on Zoom. And so we took this trip to see family we haven't seen in, in this entire year. We did rapid tests so that we could actually see them and hug them. And um, 
we finally got up to Connecticut where we were going on that Sunday night, ready for Monday to start, ready for school to begin, and we discovered that we forgot something very important, a computer charger, because there's nothing more important in 2020 than a computer charger if you were going to work from home and be remote. And so waking up on Monday morning was like, well, we're not going to be able to do this without this particular computer charger because they're all different. They're all different, and you can't just have one and substitute it for another. And so I woke up and looked at where can I find that computer charger and how close is it to me, and it was an hour away at this Best Buy. And I immediately thought, this is an absolute inconvenience. I love my kids, but that love is being tested in this current moment. And so I set off on this drive by myself, which as a father is also known as heavenly bliss. And... I set off on this drive, and an inconvenience turned into this invitation from God to be with him. I was thinking, oh, I'll catch up on the podcasts that I have subscribed to and never listened to. And instead, God said, no, I just want you to be with me. And in that car ride for that hour, God just began to take me back throughout my life and say, here are all the assignments that I have trusted you with. And let me show you why. Let me show you why I gave you that assignment, even the personal ones with this wife and these kids that I've gifted you with. Let me show you the careers and the paths that I've taken you on. Let me show you the ministry opportunities and the people that I've put in your path to minister to. Let me show you these assignments. And as I started to look at all these different assignments, there were times where I was like, God, that one was really hard. Like, why me? Like, why did you do that? And he said, I I gave it to you specifically because I knew you'd say yes. And I was like, thanks? Like, that one was real hard. And at the same time, God showed me the assignments that I said yes to, but I wasn't completely faithful in. And I said, can I go pass fail on that? Can we just, like, not do grades, but just say, like, Where's the grace in that? And what I began to see is that when my heart said yes to God and fully relied on him, I saw his faithfulness come through in miraculous ways. But when my heart kind of gave a half-hearted yes, yes, but I'm gonna try to take control over this and I'm not gonna really rely on you, but I'm gonna try to press it forward with my experience and my knowledge and my wisdom, I saw it fall apart. And looking at that idea, this this vision of God looking down from heaven and going, okay, I have this assignment and part of my mission. Who am I going to give it to? All right, I'll give it to him. And then him continuing to do that, I was like, that is beautiful. And then I was like, but is that biblical? (laughs) Like, did I just make that up? Did I just hear from God and invented it? And because I remember some words in the scripture of that. And then I started to look at it in the scriptures and found it, and I was like, okay, good. I'm not crazy. We're not too crazy. And in the midst of that, what I saw is this language throughout the scriptures uh, that that is true, that God is looking down and going, I have an assignment for these specific people, and I'm looking for, for them, just one. They would just say, yes, God, I'll trust you with that. The clearest kind of description of that is actually found in 2 Chronicles. What are you pointing to? We can edit that out later. Um, um, In 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, um, it reads that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. The God looks throughout the earth and says, I have, I'm ready with all of my strength to put it behind anyone whose heart will say yes. See, because we read that word blameless and we think, oh, if anyone's perfect or pure, and <laughs> newsflash, no one. But the word is a heart that's made ready and a heart that is willing. That's all that God looks for. He's not searching your LinkedIn profile to go, let's see, does the resume line up with the job? (laughs) He's not looking at your dating profile to go, did you curate it perfectly? You know, he's, he's looking down and saying, I just need a heart. 
a willing spirit that says yes, and then my strength and my resume and my abilities, those get infused behind that heart to accomplish something they would never do on their own. See, that scripture came to King Asa, and it came in the 36th year of his reign. For the first 35 years, he had led with a heart that said yes to God. When he first became king, he said, I'm going to create this pure devotion where we will be a people that don't worship other gods, but that we will only worship God. And shortly after that, a battle came to him, and the army was three times the size of his. It says over a million people were coming against him. And his heart turned to God and said, oh, Lord, there was no one like you to help. And so we turn to you, Lord, as our strength, and we rely on you. And it says, because of that, God routed this army, this kind of coming war coming against him. God defeated them on their behalf because they said, yes, I will rely on God. And for the next 35 years, King Asa said yes to God, yes to God, yes to God, until the 36th year. Because over those 35 years, he had amassed wealth and victories and experience. And after those 35 years, another army came against him and he said, you know, I'm going to rely on this wealth to create a partnership with another army so that they'll work with me to defeat it. And God said, because you did that, you're going to miss out on my strength and support. See, King Asa is us. We will say yes to God. And then eventually we're like, well, not that yes. <laughs> yes, and, and these things, but now, now that I've seen, you know, the strength that I have, I'm going to rely on myself. And the testament of the scriptures is that God continued to do that, looking throughout the earth, going, who will say yes? And all too often, often, he found that there was no one. In Ezekiel chapter 22, he rebukes the people of Israel because they're in a setting just like ours. As I read this, check off the boxes that sound like 2020 in New York City. He says, their princes in their midst are like wolves tearing the prey, shedding blood, destroying lives to get dishonest gain. Her prophets have smeared whitewash for them, seeing false visions and divining lies for them, saying, thus says the Lord God when the Lord has not spoken. The people of land have practiced extortion and committed robbery. They have oppressed the poor and needy and have extorted from the sojourner without justice. And I sought for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the breach before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none." He says, I'm just looking for one, one that will say yes to fight injustice, one that will say yes, that will stand to say, I will listen to God and not to false prophets, one that will say, I will not fall into this political division, but I will choose to follow the leadership of Jesus, the leadership of God. He said he found none. Will God continue to find none? The beauty of the scriptures is that that pattern stops eventually and begins to shift because he found one, Jesus Christ, who came out of heaven from the Son of God and said, I will take on flesh and dwell amongst them, and I will walk to their lame and see them and help them walk. I will see them who need healing, and I will heal them. I will set prisoners free by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he will stand in the greatest gap, the gap between you and God. And on his cross, on the cross that he took, he shed blood for us so that he would bear our sin and our punishment. And then he would die for us so that he could resurrect. And there began to be a turning point where he would pour out the spirit to anyone who would say, yes, you are king of kings, lord of lords, no other name will we bow down to. And he says he pours his spirit into them, changing their heart. From a heart of stone that said no to a heart of flesh so that he could mold and shape so that we would say yes. 
And that Holy Spirit inside of believers began to completely change the game because God now looked down and he saw in them his heart. And he said, that's a heart I can use and put my full strength behind to give courage and support to accomplish my mission. And there he stands again looking down at us and says, who will say yes? And on Mission Sunday, what we are celebrating, and on Mission Sunday is that we have looked out to partner with organizations and leaders who have that heart to say yes and I will have God's heart. My heart is made ready and willing to go after the things that he cares about. And so we as a church historically have said yes. But we cannot be like King Asa. We must continue to say yes. To say that God looks to and fro and he will look at this church, LMCC. And we will continue to have the heart that says we will stand in that gap. And we will partner with others who stand in that gap so that injustice ends in our time, so that this city is rebuilt in the image of God, not in the image of man, so that our world can hear that there's a church that will say, put your full support behind us, God, because it's massive what you're asking of us, but we will say yes and trust that you can do it with this little church. (laughs) He just looks for one. And in Jesus, the Spirit says, you can be that one. And here on Mission Sunday, we've historically allowed you to hear these stories of people who have said yes and those we have partnered with. And we prepared a video so that you can hear stories of how the yes of this community, partnering with the yes of others to God, has led to these miraculous and beautiful stories of God working in the lives of those who need it most. So let's watch this video. My name is Rebecca Iorks, and I've been directing LMCC's Outside Giving for the last several months. I'm so excited that you get to join us this morning to celebrate. Since LMCC began, God has chosen to bless this particular group of people at this particular moment of time to be part of an amazing story where he has transformed this thing, this commodity that we call money, into something that is able to be a blessing, that is able to glorify God and is able to transform the world around us to look a little bit more like he intended. And so today, um, as we do every year, we set aside a Sunday to be able to celebrate the work that they are doing and that God has done through them. My full names are Okidi Rainbow Mike. The official title that I carry here is the Executive Director of Shalom Reconciliation Ministry. Discipleship making is the heart of Shalom. Like everything else we are doing, all of the programs connects back to the gospel. And everything we're trying to do, either meeting physical needs of the people, Uh, or materials need and whatever we are trying to sow God's love to the people. Most times we have been on our knees praying and trusting God and we've seen God really providing and just acting as we ask Him in prayers. Hey LMCC, what's up? It's me Ralph and this is uh, Kenneth Hospital, the hospital that you guys are helping us with. Here we are in um, at the hospital. I just wanted you to see it, uh, where we treat women and children primarily, but also uh, men and teenagers, And but we specialize with women and children. We treat patients from over 95 different countries, including Pakistan, Afghanistan, Yemen, Sudan, Syria, Somalia, Ethiopia, all over the region. We don't turn anybody away. We have a staff of over 35 different nationalities. It's just incredible. So thanks for all your help in the transition expenses of this hospital, and you're gonna be hearing more about it soon. Thanks. Hi, LMCC. Um, Thank you so much for your generosity. Uh, Do For One builds relationships between people with and without disabilities. And our saying this year has been, events are canceled, relationships are not. We've seen our voluntary advocates responding to needs like setting up grocery and medicine deliveries and and celebrating birthdays. 
to our surprise, we've actually recruited a lot of new people this year. Um, we even started uh, regular prayer gatherings on Zoom where we pray together as a community. Um, it's not to say that it's been an easy year, but as we look ahead, um, one of the pictures that I have is a garden of flowers coming up through the cracks in the concrete. There's a brokenness for sure, but God is bringing new life into New York and it can't be done without you. So thank you again. Hi, this is Emily Prince, founder and executive director of Expect Hope, and we are so grateful to you for coming alongside us, reflecting God's heart of valuing life from the moment of conception to a person's last breath. And that's what we uphold in Expect Hope in our 24-7 ministry to unsupported expectant mothers and their babies. Thank you. Hello, Lower Manhattan Community Church. My name is Stephanie, and I'm a part of the team at Restore NYC, where we exist to make freedom real for survivors of trafficking. As you may know, COVID-19 has had a devastating impact on survivors of trafficking, a crime that disproportionately impacts Black, Latina, and immigrant women. But thanks to the generous support of people like you, we've been able to continue our services to survivors and continue our support to them as they rebuild the life intended. This support looks like cash assistance, rent assistance, clothing, medicine, whatever the survivor may need. So thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your continued support. We could not do this work without you. Thank you so much. Hello, Lower Manhattan Community Church. It's Juan Galloway, I'm president of New York City Relief. We're one of your missions partners, and I'm just here to say thank you. Because of your partnership during this pandemic season, we have been able to serve thousands of people struggling with homelessness in our city. Guys, because of you, we were able to distribute 30,000 masks. You know, people are desperate out there and they need help now more than ever. And this season, we actually made 600 connections for people on the streets to 97 different resources to help them turn their lives around. It's amazing. Not only that, but we innovated. We actually gave out over 400 cell phones to people so that they could contact their family. They could journey with us as we coached them and work with them to get them off the streets. And we even helped the elderly and those who are sickly to get off the streets. We actually provided over 500 nights of hotel stays. We couldn't have done it without you. And so we just want to say thank you. And for those of you who haven't joined us on the streets and volunteered on the relief bus, get out there and let's do it together. And that's the story of our outside giving. Every year, LMCC gives a third of its funds to organizations, to nonprofits, to churches that are serving in New York City and that are serving around the world to be a blessing and to be um, a symbol of justice and mercy. Um, and in our world. I give my riches to you, the work of my hands, the breath of my lungs, the fruit of my lands. I give my riches to you, the silver and gold, whoever they are. I know, I know, I give my riches to you, the work of my the breath of my lungs, the fruit of my plans, I give my riches to you, the silver and gold. We always describe it as a humbling privilege to be a part of that. Just what an incredible video. Just a huge thank you to Michael and Rebecca and Kara. Um, And, you know, without Rebecca, the ability for us to respond quickly to COVID-19 and the pandemic of racial injustice and continue to partner, we wouldn't be able to do it. So a huge thank you to Rebecca Iwerks. She's right over here. So um, That video ended with the phrase, God's not done. And we agree with that. And I, we agree with it on a few fronts. We don't believe God's done even with our giving, even for this year. We are praying and asking God to be specific and tell us where he wants to make another, another area of impact, 
to say, I want money to be set free from something that we worship to be used as something to worship God and advance justice. And so we are praying for that. But we also believe that God is not done in what he has asked us to do. There will be new assignments for us as a church as we look ahead. One day this pandemic will end and there is a rebuilding that God is wanting to see, a rebuilding of this community, a rebuilding of this city. And God looks down and he's looking for a remnant. He's looking for a remnant of people that just say, we will be the ones that say yes. We will be the ones that say, what you ask, we will do. We will be the ones that when you ask for our money, we will give it so we can be free and so others can experience freedom. We will be the ones that say, if you want to use us and the Holy Spirit to move in powerful ways beyond what we've imagined, we will say yes. Yesterday, I was uh, doing some Legos with my daughter, and she put together this massive Lego set, like 4,000 pieces of Diagon Alley, in case you think my obsession with Harry Potter has died. <laughs> and the idea was that Diagon Alley could then fold and attach together but when we went to attach it together, there was one piece that had been put in wrong, and so it didn't actually fit. <laughs> and she found herself in tears, <laughs> 4,000 pieces and one that is causing a problem. And because what she was seeing was this massive work ahead of taking it apart <laughs> and then putting it back together. But we went over there and we looked, and we looked for different ways to solve the problem. And it turned out that we could do so simply if we just were open to a different solution, believing that we were problem solvers, not just people facing problems. And as we just did a small little simple solution, it began to work. And I just looked at her and I said, this is who we are. We're problem solvers. And I look at you, this church, and I say, that's who we are. We're problem solvers not because of who we are, but because who our God is. Because he has all the solutions for the problems that you are currently facing. He has all the solutions for the problems our city and our world are facing. And he simply is saying, will you say yes to trust that I am the ultimate problem solver and I have made you to be a people who solve problems? He looks down from heaven, ready to give his full support to those whose heart is fully his. And I say yes, and we as a church say yes. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you are putting together a family that bears your name, that bears your identity, and bears your power to a world in desperate need. And God, we look out to the world and say, the problem seems so big. But to you, the solutions are so simple. And so we surrender our hearts and our lives and ourselves that your spirit could use us to do miracles and to do massive works again and again and again because we know that you're not done. We believe you're just getting started and we wanna be a part of it. So we say yes to you. In Jesus' name, amen.